Michigan. This is your TV6 Early News. Marquette man who shot and killed another person in an apartment that was also a meth lab. Embezzlement, an Antonagan woman who allegedly stole thousands of dollars from a youth hockey program. Park Rangers, when the visitors leave, what do they do in the winter? It's your Facebook story tonight. Getaway day for the Thanksgiving holiday weekend and some changes coming to traffic patterns for Black Friday. Your TV6 Medical Minute tonight, Dr. Michael Grossman talks about the medications being used to control type 2 diabetes. For Weather Center 6, I'm Carl Bonak. A warm start to the holiday. Will it hold through the weekend? We'll tell you in a few minutes. I'm Mike Ludlum in sports. Logically, we'll talk about the Packers and Lions game and some more UP football players receive All-State honors. Plus a local restaurant getting ready for a Thanksgiving community feast. It's next on your TV6 Early News. For Upper Michigan, Steve Aspel, Carl Bonac Weather, and Mike Ludlam Sports. This is your TV6 Early News. A Marquette man shot another man to death, and today he found out the penalty he'll be paying. 22-year-old Tyler Wolf pled no contest to involuntary manslaughter in October. Today in Marquette County Circuit Court, he was sentenced to just over seven years to 15 years in prison. Wolf shot and killed 49-year-old John Bradbury September 21st at a West Ridge Street apartment in the city of Marquette. Wounded in that shooting, 23-year-old Rayanne Zimmerman. She has since recovered. The apartment was also the site of a meth lab. State police and hazardous materials crews cleaned up the chemicals. An Antonagan woman is arrested after a two-month investigation of the Antonagan Youth Hockey Association's financial transactions. Concerned board members contacted state police after they became suspicious of 43-year-old Ann Pollard. Pollard had been serving as the association treasurer for the past two years. The investigation determined a large amount of money was taken from the youth program and used for personal interest. State police arrested Pollard and issued a warrant for embezzlement by an agent or trustee between one and $20,000. If Pollard is convicted, she faces up to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Well, it's a victory tonight for Rio Tinto and Kennecott Eagle Minerals Mine in Marquette County. A downstate judge has agreed with the state DEQ saying they've acted lawfully when issuing a permit allowing the company to build and operate the copper and nickel mine and discharge treated wastewater. The National Wildlife Federation has not said if they'll appeal that ruling. Kennecott Eagle is targeting an underground ore deposit that's expected to yield up to 300 million pounds of nickel and about 200 million pounds of copper. The company began blasting the mine entrance in September. The Marquette Department of Natural Resources says things have been looking good for hunters coming into the deer check stations this year. Now, Some say they've seen more deer brought into the stations compared to last year. They also report a mixture of older and younger bucks, some weighing close to 200 pounds. It's a pretty good year on, on an overall. I mean, we're not done yet, and we had a little bit of weather push through, and it seemed like uh, more guys started stopping in at the hunter check station and, and telling stories. Biologists say the most interesting thing they've seen this year remains to be the eight-point albino buck brought in on opening day. They're hoping to see more children at the check stations this season. Well, Bark River Harris Elementary students recently had their Native American Month celebration, and it's a way for them to learn more about their heritage. There are between 600 and 650 students at the school, and 100 of them are Native American. Christy Erickson, a first grade teacher at the school, but is also the Title VII coordinator. Title VII is a federal grant allowing her to provide tutoring services to these students. Some of them showed off their Native regalia during their music program assembly. I think that's really important in today's society um, because kids need to learn about that. They need to feel ownership and be proud of their background and their heritage and not kind of push it aside. The Native American Music and Culture Program was funded in part by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the Michigan Humanities Council. As the fall tourism season wound down, our Facebook fans wanted to know what do national and state park rangers do in the winter? Well, TV6's Nikki Davidson is joining us now, and she has the answer. Nikki? 
Well, Steve, most parks are busiest in July and August. We forget that many parks stay pretty active when the winter snowmobilers and cross-country skiers come in. A good portion of ranger jobs are seasonal, but there also are some permanent employees, ones that are especially important during an emergency. Things are looking pretty quiet at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, but that doesn't mean Acting Chief Ranger Bill Smith's to-do list is short. He and his team are gearing up for the winter tourist season. The protection rangers at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore spend 60 to 70 percent of their time outside even during the winter time doing various activities like putting up this snow protection fence to deter illegal snowmobiling activity. We're also in charge of the grooming and upkeep of 22 miles of cross-country ski trail and patrolling the area. Uh, we're not just sitting around in the winter months. We're staying very, very busy. And they aren't alone. Facebook fan Viva Shard writes, My brother works for Hartwick Pine State Park. He works year-round with only a couple weeks off. And of course, in these conditions, emergencies can occur. Uh, we do respond to more serious accidents, too. Um, some fatalities or serious injuries. Being proficient on your snowmobile, being proficient on cross-country skis, being proficient on snowshoes. The story is much the same for Michigan State Parks if the location stays open in the winter. 60% of state ranger jobs are seasonal. During the winter, those people may be transported to another location, seek another job, or receive unemployment. Places like Van Riper State Park and Porcupine Mountains continue to be staffed 365 days of the year. The Parks and Recreation Department says for now, their budget can only accommodate staffing a few parks year Around. The demands are great on us, but uh, we manage to make do and, and get things done. Now, there are also several park rangers that specialize in education, biology, or even serve as historians. And many of those employees will perform their duties as usual during the winter season. Steve? Thanks a lot, Nikki. Now, due to the Thanksgiving holiday, we won't have the Facebook story of the day this Thursday or Friday, but your votes for today's choices will count toward Monday's Facebook story of the day. Here are those choices. First, evergreen trees. Why don't they all change? Why just some? Second, holiday decorating safety. What are some things you need to know before you put up the holiday lights or decorate around your home? And third, driving a semi. What does it take to drive a semi tractor trailer and what are the pros and cons? Go to the TV6 Facebook page and vote for your favorite story. Well, a Marquette businessman is doing his part to spread a little holiday cheer this Thanksgiving. Brian French, owner of Aubrey's Pizza in Marquette, has been busy preparing this year's Thanksgiving Day feast for St. Mark's Church in Marquette. Although he's been preparing as much as he can, most of the meal will be cooked tomorrow morning, starting at 4 a.m. The meal will consist of traditional fare such as green bean casserole, sweet potatoes, and over 150 pounds of turkey. This is the fifth year French has participated in making the meal, and he says he understands why it's so important. Well, I'd like to give back to my community. Oh, man. You know, quite honestly, I don't have any family in town, and truly it's a great way, you know, I'm spending it with some great people. The St. Mark's Thanksgiving meal will be served tomorrow at 1 p.m. Well, whether your holiday plans include shopping or not, you still may have to deal with Thanksgiving weekend traffic, and the weather should not be a factor. However, throughout the UP, there are eight different traffic lights that will be modified for Thursday evening through Friday. Usually in the late evening, lights are timed to switch to a flash mode for a smoother traffic flow instead of switching like they normally do. Now traffic signals will remain on their normal settings. In the Marquette area, the Commerce Road intersection and the US-41 Walmart Target intersection are both being affected by this change. One thing to remember is that there are going to be people driving in areas that they're not real familiar with, so everyone just needs to be patient, slow down, and drive defensively. MDOT is focusing on signal changes in areas that are business heavy. They're expecting extra traffic in the early morning hours of Friday. And it should be a nice day that day. Another nice day today. Even some sunshine as the Mercury continues its upward climb, Carl. It's looking like a quiet night, too. Right. Uh, currently, Mersey Oats in Marquette is sitting at 39 degrees. A southwest breeze, the barometer is holding steady. And it's that time of the year. Winter is closing in, even though it won't feel like that over the next couple of days. And we've got the winter outlook posted. Go to UpperMichiganSource.com, click on weather and blogs for that. Our Portage Health Houghton Hancock weather cam, it's a quiet night. We do expect a, a warm start. However, as we work through the weekend, things will start to change. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
Thanks, Carl. Your TV6 Medical Minute is just ahead. And tonight, tonight, Dr. Michael Grossman talks about type 2 diabetes and the medications being used to treat this common disease. And later, deck the windows with lots of holly and everything else as downtown Houghton businesses are in competition with one another. That story following sports on your TV6 Early News. Type 2 diabetes is the most common form of diabetes. Currently, about 90% of those who have diabetes have type 2. A variety of medications are used for diabetes. The first group is called metformin, a medication which is the first drug that we usually use and it works quite well. A second class are called the sulfonylureas. They help reduce blood sugar by having the pancreas secrete more insulin. A third new class of drugs called incretins are unique in that they do not cause any weight gain as some of the older drugs do. Uh, the only problem with the incretins is they are quite expensive as they're new. Many people will need to use insulin to control their diabetes. Actually, 50% of those who have had diabetes for 10 years or longer will need insulin. Don't be afraid of insulin if your doctor prescribes it. It's quite easy. Often it's in pen form, and if you need an injection, you just open the pen, inject the insulin. This is Dr. Michael Grossman for TV6's Medical Minute. Your TV6 Medical Minute can be seen each Wednesday right here on your TV6 Early News. WYKX, WDBC, we're together working with the TV6 Canathon Drive at the Delta County Supermarkets, but officials say this year's turnout was not as strong as last year's. The drive was at the Super Value in Gladstone and Elmer's and Super One in Escanaba. The food and donations collected at Super One will go to the Salvation Army, and so far they've collected 1,660 pounds of food. St. Vincent de Paul will get the food and money that's brought in at Elmer's. They're at 4,500 pounds of food there, which is down from last year. But the radio personalities say every little bit helps. You know, a lot of people, of course, are out getting some last-minute items before their, their turkey dinner uh, that they're having for their families and stuff. So I'm hoping that those people that do come out, you know, have a little room in their heart to uh, share the wealth and help out those that are uh, less fortunate. And rocker Eddie Money was even in town for the weekend show at the Isla Resort and Casino, and he stopped by to help out with the TV6 Catathon. Nice to see everybody getting into the holiday spirit. Well, your holiday weather outlook is straight ahead, and can this warm-up we're in hold through the entire Thanksgiving holiday weekend? Well, TV6 meteorologist Carl Bonek has that detailed forecast next. On Wall Street today, well, another downer. The Dow losing 236 and the Nasdaq sinking 61. Europe's widening debt crisis and a weak report on Chinese manufacturers causing the steep losses. Gold prices falling $7, ending at $1,696 an ounce. And crude oil prices losing $1.84, closing at $96.17 a barrel. There's a look at today's most active issues and stocks of local interest. Temperatures across the UP only in the mid-30s at uh, Munising, 34, also at Escanaba, Iron Mountain, and Florence, but 40s at Lance, as well as Ontonagon, 39 at Copper Harbor. 40s across the board downstate, upper 30s at the Sioux, and low 40s on the west end of Lake Superior. Here's our satellite view. Lots of low clouds. That's the problem uh, these days at this time of the year, but they have been eroding some high clouds working in from the northwest. What we have is high pressure down to our south and general low pressure up to the northwest. That means a west to southwest flow and that means things are warming up. It was up to 60 degrees earlier at Bismarck, now down to 45. 51 at Billings, still 60 at Denver. Warming up underneath this big ridge that's developing with the main storm still in the Gulf of Alaska. Here's the way things look on Thursday. Low pressure in central Canada, high pressure off to our southeast. That means a strengthening south to southwest wind flow. Any low clouds and fog early should dissipate and it should be warm for Thanksgiving. Then on Friday, an increase in clouds still warm. Low pressure begins to develop in the central plains. That system will gradually deepen and move toward us on Saturday. Looks like a little rain and then behind it colder air starts to filter in as the low moves to the east. Could even be some some snow, especially over the western highlands, late Saturday night into Sunday. Back with your detailed forecast next. 
Temperatures early tomorrow will be around 30 into the 30s, coldest in the interior. There may be some more patchy fog developing during the night. And then tomorrow at noon, midday, we expect temperatures already well into the 40s. Some spots over the western UP and going up. It looks like some areas, especially along the Lake Superior shore, could get to around or even exceed 50 degrees. Your forecast tonight, partly cloudy, some patchy fog possible again. Lows ranging from the upper 20s to the upper 30s along Lake Superior in the north. Then for tomorrow, a west to east split. The warmest temperatures likely along the Lake Superior shore in the uh, western UP with strengthening southwest winds to the 40s elsewhere. Your TV six day forecast. Some spots may not get below 40 on uh, Thanksgiving night. Then highs in the 40s to near 50 on Friday. Then a slow cooling trend that low moves in. Some rain on Saturday and again a chance of some wet snow, especially in the western highlands. Saturday night into Sunday. Looking like a pretty nice Thanksgiving. That's for sure. All right, make it a good one. Thanks a lot, Carl. Your sports is next, and tonight, more high school football players earn honors on the AP All-State team. TV6's Mike Ludlam runs down the honorees, and you'll hear from the Packers about their opponent, the Lions, in tomorrow's big game. Your sports when we return on your TV6 Early News. Good evening, everyone. Three Upper Peninsula High School football players have landed berths on the Associated Press All-State Team for Divisions 5 and 6. And two of them were Dream Team members of the Upper Peninsula. That would be running back Tanner Mako of Menominee and Ty Ta Tommen of Iron Mountain. Uh, punter Ben Storm was a Class ABC first teamer from the Upper Peninsula. He's named as punter, so congratulations to those three players. Injured Green Bay Packers running back James Starks may be able to play tomorrow in Detroit. Coach Mike McCarthy says the decision will be made before the game. Starks, the tight team's leading rusher, was listed as questionable on the injury report after participating in a short walkthrough session today. Starks suffered a sprained knee and ankle injury in the final minutes of the win over Tampa Bay on Sunday. McCarthy says getting pushed by Tampa Bay will help against the Lions. Ready to play, you know, big game uh, on on national TV, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and adversity are healthy situations to learn from, especially when you overcome it. We we had some tough adversity games early in the year. We, uh, you know, we have we didn't challenge as much in the fourth quarter. So, uh, I think this is something we could benefit from. Uh, it's going to be tough for both of us, but we have to find a way. We've. Uh, you know, we've, we've uh, took, taken care of the first two steps in this uh, ten and a half day, three game deal. So, just got to get back. Uh, I think we're, Mike's going to take care of our bodies this week and, and take it easy on us. Get in that training room, get in that hot tub, get in that cold tub, and uh, hopefully be ready by Thursday. Roger says he was disappointed in his performance against the Buccaneers. Lions players also say they didn't play their best game against Carolina. Kickoff from Ford Field, as you know by now, is set for 12.30 Eastern, 11.30 Central time tomorrow. You can see the game on our sister station, Fox UP. This will mark the 20th time the Lions will face the Packers on Thanksgiving, with the Lions holding an 11-7-1 edge. The Packers beat the Lions 34-12 in their last Thanksgiving matchup in 2009. The Lions have lost seven Thanksgiving Day games in a row, dating back to that 22-14 victory over the Packers in 2003. An Upper Peninsula wrestler has earned Conference Player of the Week honors from the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. Gladstone's Joe Molesky of Wisconsin Stevens Point won the 133-pound championship at the Concordia University Open over the weekend. Molesky was a perfect 5-0 against some of the nation's best wrestlers. In the finals, Molesky defeated All-American and second-ranked Tom Baraka from Wartburg College of Iowa 12-7. All kinds of information is available on our website, as you know, at Upper, Upper Michigan Source.com. All right, big game, and we'll all be tuned in for it. Yes. All right, thanks a lot, Mike. We'll be right back. Finally, tonight, the city of Houghton is already getting into the holiday spirit. Many of the businesses downtown are decorating their storefront windows. Flickering lights, snowmen, and even Santa Claus have made their way into the displays. Pretty much what they do is they start decorating now and they have till December 16th. That's when the judging will be done. Um, and to decorate their windows in any festive manner that they, they see fit. 
Once the judges pick who they think has the best display, the winner will be awarded an advertising package. This is a competition among the local businesses, and it's only been going on for a couple of years. The businesses say this is a perfect opportunity for them to round up the family and take a walk downtown to look at all the different displays. That does it for your TV6 Early News. From all of us here, have yourself a very safe and happy Thanksgiving. Up next, it's NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Don't forget to join us online anytime and also on Facebook.